in northern Tanzania, there's a place called Lao Toli. Most tourists who go the, to that region, go to the Serengeti and other big national parks, go right by Lao Toli because at first glance, it's an unremarkable bit of savanna. But what makes Lao Toli special is that laid out in volcanic ash are footprints. Footprints made by early hominids, early ancestors of humans, that were laid down over 3.5 million years ago. Now to me, what makes this place really special is not just the hominid prints, but also all the other prints that surround these footprints. They're prints of lots of other kinds of animals that live there. So you see hyena prints, an extinct form of elephant, wild boar, and many other species, actually 20 other species of animals crisscrossing these early proto-human prints, if you will. It makes you realize that as long as humans have been on this planet, we have been part of and interacting with nature. And sure enough, we've modified nature in all sorts of ways. We clear grasslands by burning them. We cut down forests and have been doing so for a long time. We've domesticated animals like horses and, and uh, dogs. And all those things have had a big impact on the planet. We've caused extinctions of species in the Pleistocene, big mammals like the mastodon and the mammoth. And with that kind of extinction, the extinction of these big mammals, we might have even tampered with the atmosphere. Those animals produced methane. When we wiped them out, we reduced the concentration of methane in the atmosphere. So humans have been a huge influence on the planet and nature, and we've been part of it. Then came agriculture. And with agriculture and the settlement of cities came specialization. When we started specializing on one particular kind of job, we started divorcing ourselves from nature. The guy who makes the wheel no longer needs to know where his water comes from or where food comes from. He can simply trade that wheel for food. And that has continued all the way into the industrial era. Go out on the street today and ask someone, where does your water come from? What are they going to tell you? They're going to say the tap, right? They're not going to really think about the river. So the pendulum has swung all the way from connection with nature to disconnection with nature. But now it's starting to swing back again for three interesting reasons. Reason one is that science has come up to a point where we can really understand the impacts we're having on the planet. The second is social networks. Social networks today are allowing us to collaborate and create collective action and also understand collective impacts around the planet. So something that's happening to me here, I can communicate with and compare with what's happening in China, for example, in real time. And the third reason is we're a planet with 7 billion people heading to 10 billion. When you have that many people, every impact is going to have a ripple effect. So those three reasons are really causing the pendulum to sort of shift back today and once again make us rethink our connection to nature. Instead of seeing humans as separate from nature, we're starting to once again understand that nature in some ways is the ultimate social network, and we humans are very much part of it. Now nothing brings to me that point, or illustrates that point better than those photographs that came to Earth from those uh, Apollo astronauts. So when, when the astronauts went out to space and took those photographs, all of a sudden we could see the whole planet. We could see all of planet Earth for the first time in the history of humans. In fact, in the history of any species that has ever lived on the planet. And that moment to me really symbolizes this next era that we're going into. An era where our eyes are opened to the impact that we can have, but we also have the opportunity now to do something about it, and do something about it at a planetary scale. So how do I feel about the future? Here's what I think. I think technology will really help us to a great deal in moving us forward, in solving some of the big intractable problems we have today. But really and most importantly, I think what's going on is right now we have that window, that narrow window in time where pretty much any problem that we can see, we can start to understand it, fully understand it, and also have the opportunity to do something about it. When it comes to population, we're at 7 billion, we'll probably end up at 10, maybe 11 billion, but most, most scientists agree that we're going to start leveling off and population will eventually be stable. The one part that we don't really know much about is consumption. 
how much we consume. And we consume all this stuff, not just because we need it, but because we think it actually makes us feel happy. That's a really weird thing. So it turns out that virtually any way in you can measure human well-being, whether it's healthcare or education or how long we live, things have been getting better. But when it comes to happiness, it's not so clear. Are we really happy than, we, than our parents were? And are they, were they really happier than you know, several generations ago? That's a harder question to answer. If we can divorce now our need for consumption as the driver towards happiness, then I think we really have a chance of not just living uh, f and fulfilling our aspirations on this planet, but doing so in a way in which they can really make us feel happy as well as make sure there's enough space for everyone else. I believe that current electronics based on the big size and high performance and huge energy consuming electronics change its paradigm to flexible, lightweight, and cell power devices that can be used in a human friendly electronics. Here's our group's achievements that one plastic substrate generating power itself and computing and communicating with others that can uh, detecting or treating the disease or even blind people can see. And first topic that I want to discuss is the cell power energy. If device generating power itself, they can be used in a implantable biomedical device and sensor network for the environment and safety and energy source for the flexible electronics and the machines. And here's uh, our group's the vision that shows that the uh, one plastic substrate generating power and computing, light emitting device and communication with the other and then attached to the human organs, detecting the signal and the treating the disease. How, uh, how we make a cell powered devices is the thin plastic substrate. We fabricate flexible piezoelectric nanomaterial so bending the plastic substrate or slight movement of a plastic substrate generating the power. Our device is achieved uh, 40 times higher than current world record. And by using this slight movement of a human biomechanical movement can generate power enough to operate the implantable face maker realizing cell powered face makers. This shows that the Flexible plastic substrate by bending motion can turn you on the 100 LED and then movement of uh, plastic can su supply the energy to make a uh, face maker to regulate the heartbeat to make cell powered face maker. One plastic substrate in backside cell powered energy devices in front flexible gallium arsenide LED making a fully flexible system to operate in, without outside energy sources. Uh, next slide, another demonstration of a cell power device. By mixing two nanomaterials together in polymeric matrix, they can make an energy harvesting device that can be flexible and stretchable and slight movement of a finger and footstep can generate the power. Here demonstration shows a flexible thin film battery. Look at the, how the flexibility can we achieve with our battery. And then the right image shows that the one plastic substrate implant flexible OLED backside flexible thin film battery so that without outside energy source, we can demonstrate the display. We also demonstrate the high density plastic uh, flexible uh, memory devices. We fabricate high density memristor device on grass substrate and irradiating laser from the backside. We only can transfer the top 100 nanometer high density memory on plastic substrate. We also can make a flexible computing LSI chip. On plastic substrate, they are very flexible and then they can operate the flexible display and very flexible smartwatch 
and using the communication tool for arti artificial retina system. As you know, Korean major industry already has the flexible display technology will be out soon. Our group also uh, licensed one of the technology and then to put our technology in a mass production line using the laser lift up of active matrix inorganic materials. Final a product that I wanted to introduce, the flexible inorganic gallium nitride and gallium arsenide LED. These material or devices are perfect candidate for the future uh, biomedical devices that can detecting and treating the disease. So here's summary. KAIST developed flexible energy source, flexible optoelectronic LED, high density memory, and computation and communication tool merged with the flexible display that can make a cell-powered, fully flexible electronic system. Here's my question. How will flexible high-tech can increase quality of our life or changing our lifestyle? Please join me to discuss our future life in Crazy Idea. Thank you. MC10 enhances human capabilities by taking electronics out of the box onto and even into the human body. Since the computer chip was invented, our lives have changed dramatically. The way we communicate, the way we work, the way we consume entertainment. You know, it's true that Moore's Law has delivered smaller, cheaper, and faster electronics and very cool products, but these are essentially just smaller versions of the rigid bricks that we've all grown accustomed to. We overlook inconvenience and discomfort because the pros outweigh the cons. We conform to our electronics without even thinking much about it. But in the natural world, and for human beings in particular, are not rigid and boxy. MC10 rejects the premise that microelectronics must be two-dimensional and planar. Instead, we make electronics that conform to us and this change in form has the power to change our lives. Now, a smart sensing sticker worn like a kid's fake tattoo can sense how our bodies work, data from the heart, our brain, muscles, even body temperature and hydration levels. And since it's virtually invisible, it can be worn for long periods of time without discomfort. MC10 uses this core technology in many different applications for optimizing performance of athletes, for connected monitoring of chronic health, for interventional medical devices. We are literally reshaping electronics into conformal products that bend, stretch, and flex seamlessly with the body. As a result, MC10 is bringing high performance electronics to entirely new applications that empower all of us to play an active role in staying healthy. Innovators challenge the status quo and come up with simple insights that change the direction of improvement. At MC10, we challenge these givens, that high-performance silicon is brittle and rigid, that miniaturization of products is enough, that strapping boxy devices to our wrists or chest is okay, that we must conform to our electronics. At MC10, we innovate along a new axis based on form, providing design freedom for a range of new products. For the world's growing and aging population, we need smarter, cheaper ways to monitor health status outside the hospital. Today, we learn about our health very occasionally and episodically. As a result, we access care sometimes in the most costly setting often when a condition has worsened to extreme levels. By providing continuous access to high quality biofeedback and an affordable cost, MC10 is empowering people to take more ownership of their health and to take action real time, accessing care only if and when they need it. This means doctors can monitor patients or family members can check on each other remotely it means we can combine our seamless sensing with a nearly ubiquitous mobile phone to form a high-quality connected monitoring system 
we can use to improve our health and well-being. This is Pat Salber with the Dr. Way Zinn broadcasting from the Digital Health Summit, the Summer Summit in San Francisco. And it's my pleasure to have with me, I'm probably going to blow your name, but I'm going to give it a try, <laughs> Isaiah Kasavinsky. Perfect. Kasavinsky. Okay, yeah. I don't you, even have to be corrected. You should win some type of award for that. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what I want. I want an MC10 tattoo. There you go. So uh, Isaiah is the director of sports segment with MC10, which I think is one of the coolest companies on earth. I first heard about you at Future Med, I think three years ago, yeah. and I actually have uh, oftentimes borrowed pictures of your tattoos for talks that I'm giving because they're so beautiful. So if you don't mind, Isaiah, if you could tell us a little bit about kind of the core technology yeah. of uh, MC10, and then talk to us a little bit about um, how this fits into the sports and fitness world. I understand you're a former football player, right? Yeah. Yeah, I played okay. in the, the NFL for eight years. A lot the NFL, wow. Yeah. Okay, so, there we go. This is relevant to a lot of my background. And, okay, uh, I should ask you which team, even though... Seattle Seahawks, most of my career. Okay, Seattle Seahawks, yeah. there you played go. for the Seahawks, the, the St. Louis Rams, and the Oakland Raiders, actually. Oh, the Oakland Raiders, yeah, go yeah, Raiders. Career. Okay, yeah, good. I had career-ending surgery with the Raiders, so oh. <laughs> this is not the, the best time um, with them. But, uh, yeah, so MC10 is a conformal electronics company, so we were able to innovate on form factor, uh, really uh, changing the design rules for electronics. So taking them, taking electronics uh, and thinning them and embedding them into a substrate to really take them out of this rigid box that it's, if you pick up your phone, you pick up everything around you, a lot of things are housed in these, electronics are housed in rigid boxes. Right, so I'm gonna water. translate in, yeah. in my non-tech talk yeah. and say, they're putting sensors in tattoos, the most beautiful tattoos you've ever seen that you could paste on your body. And they are, uh, you can, you, you therefore don't have to wake up in the morning and stick something yep. on or put a pendant on. I mean, you, you have your sensors with you in a really nice looking way all the time. Yeah, so we, we've taken that technology and made this electronic patch and be able to have um, those flexible, stretchable electronics uh, that can you know, be put on the body and gather data in the background where you don't have to put up with a device. So a technology on your body, you can put it on and forget about it and gather data in the background. Yeah, that's fantastic. For everything. And we're, you know, realizing that vision uh, is has been such an amazing journey over the last, you know, you, you talk about three years ago, right? Over the last three years especially on hardening that technology and bringing it to the market and really changing the way you think about electronics. Well, so whenever I talk about MC10, I say, I want one of those tattoos. Can I get one of those tattoos now? Are they on the market? 2015 uh, is going to be the year to be able to, 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 be able to access that in a, in, a, in a really, really impressive way, in a way that really is uh, going to be adoptable for use cases that are really relevant to you, to me, to, and be able to kind of change. And I know I'm kind of being somewhat nebulous about, around that, but um, really defining the way you think about wearable technology, wearable electronics. Yeah, it'll be, you know, it's the step, I view it as the step before implantables, yeah. right? Because I think that's actually where we're going. We've gone from wearables and people are embedding things in clothes and they've got them in these pendants and necklaces and, you know, bracelets and all this kind of stuff. And then we're going to go to the tattoos. And then I hope you guys have your eyesight, uh, or, or, you know, on what I think will ultimately be uh, the most convenient thing is when you just implant it under my skin or in some other place. I don't know where that might yeah, be. Yeah, I mean, that. That's that's you know for me I'm I'm constantly you know, I'm in the consumer space and the consumer space is, there's regulatory hurdles to to be able to implant things under this. Yeah, I'm sure there are. So you know having the the ability to have the technology like this is is a non-invasive way to measure a lot of different things and um, there are benefits obviously to being be able to implant things. There's obviously a lot of benefits and uh, de-risking on being able to have non-invasive technology on your body as well. Uh, but obviously, you know, we look into everything, and um, I always like to say, you know, 
MC10 it, at its core is an innovation factory. And it's, it's unbelievably a fun job to be able to say, hey, it's a really powerful technology. How can I apply this to different problems that exist in the world today and really and, and really uh, bring a product to market to, to solve that? And it's it's cool. It's, it's an innovation factory every single yeah. day, idea company. So, you know, I have to say what I really like about the interviews that we've done at this conference is that everybody loves their job. Oh, yeah. So we're almost out of time, but I wanted to have you say just a few words about uh, your presentation because you talked about a partnership with Reebok and uh, tell us about the tattoo that you're using with this uh, important sports application. Yeah, so we um, we have an Intel Inside business model. So we develop a use case, partner up with a large brand and bring it to market. Reebok uh, happened to be the, the first product we we brought to market and we measured force of impact to the head. So we took our electronics and embedded that into a skull cap to measure how hard you're, you're essentially hit. So you've taken it off the helmet and onto the head. Exactly, and tightly coupled it to the head. Because, you know, I don't care what happens to a helmet on the head. I hear what happens to the actual head itself. And that it was a, was a key, uh, one of the stakes in the ground when we were developing the technology. Our, our technology enabled, enabled that, right? To be able to put our technology in a garment, flexible electronics, and and really gather data in the background. That was, that was a key to then bring across, have this utility across sports, across activities. And uh, it's been amazing. I've been very, like, I think passion's a really, really <laughs> good way to put it. I've been very passionate um, about bringing that to market, uh, as well as um, the ideation around really solving uh, the psychological play of starting the, the conversation of when you're hit really hard, uh, taking it out of the athlete's hands or the, the person, the user's hands, right. and have this objective data point to start the conversation for them, give an opportunity to symptom report, and not diagnosing anything, but starting that conversation earlier, which in turn, you know, taking all, uh, you know, a lot of steps back. I have a, I have a 10 year old and an eight year old, right? And I, I see the world through their eyes. And being able to play sports in a safer way, period, was, was really at the core of that development. Yeah, well, I think the timing's perfect because we've been reading so much about the devastating effects that head, head injuries yep. have had, not just in professional athletes, but, as you say, even in young children. So I want to thank you very much, not only for spending time with us, but for the passion that you're bringing to this important work. And uh, I'm really glad to know that I only have to wait one more year to get my tattoo. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank I you. appreciate it. Take care. Hi, I'm Syria Gruding from Shopkick. We asked ourselves a simple question. What is truly mobile about a cell phone? What is really different about a smartphone as compared to any other platform that exists in the media world? And the answer is very simple. It's the cell phone being the only interactive medium that you carry with you in a non-interactive physical environment the only interactive medium you have with you in a non-interactive physical environment. That's really interesting because it could suddenly enable us to put a almost like a digital overlay on top of the real world and make it an interactive experience. And if you think about the real world, where is that particularly interesting? Where would you like more information when you're out? Where you, do you constantly feel like nobody knows you, nobody addresses you by name, nobody actually even treats you like a almost like a human being. You're almost like a walking number. Yes, exactly, when you're out shopping at stores. A hundred years ago, if you had gone shopping, they would have welcomed you by name by walking in and said, hi Susie, how are you today? And by the way, how is your husband? And did you like the steak we sold you last week? And nowadays, at what time do they find out you're at the store? Exactly, when you've already paid with your credit card, you've swiped it. And that's when they look at you and say, hi, how are you today? And you look back and you say, I'm doing great. And then the answer is, okay, that's good, bye. And we thought that can't be the future of shopping. It can't be that after all this time, we basically went backwards. What if we took all this learning from the last 100 years and tried to re replicate that personal experience, a more entertaining one, a more rewarding one, and a more personal experience into the real world in our large, large physical shopping world today? And the smartphone is the only one, the only medium that can make that happen. So rather than go backwards in time, we go forwards by using technology. And that's what Shopkick does. Shopkick basically uses the smartphone to make your physical shopping experience a better one. How do we do that? Well, we asked ourselves a simple question. 
how could we not only benefit the consumer, but also the retail industry? And we asked ourselves, what's the biggest problem? So we imagine taking a trip through America, and for that matter, the whole world, and talk to every store owner, what's your biggest challenge? And we thought, what if they had to all agree on the same challenge? Which one would it be? And the answer was always the same. It's called foot traffic, getting people into the door of the store. Why is that so interesting? Because the conversion rates in the physical retail world are way better than in the online world. In the online world, conversion rates from going to a site to actually buying something is only 0.5 to 3%. In the real world, it's 20 to 95%. It's 20 in fashion, 50 in electronics, and 95% in groceries. So in other words, if you could only get them through the door, you have a really good chance of making a sale. And the consumer would really like to be treated more personal. So how can we merge these two and bring them together? And the answer was, if foot traffic is so important, then how come no one ever rewards anybody for visiting a store? Why only for purchases? Why not for visits? And the answer to that question is because nobody has a clue that you're at the store until you buy something. So we said we're going to change that, and smartphones could be the way to do it. And then we imagined, OK, let's use GPS. GPS can tell you if you're at a store, right? Because it's so accurate. Well, the answer is, no, it can't. GPS is so inaccurate that it actually only delivers you information whether somebody is a block or two away, but not if somebody is really inside the store. So we had to come up with something better, because if you don't know somebody's at the store, but then you give them a reward for showing up, not everybody is honest enough to actually be at the store if you give them a reward without having to be there. So we had to develop something better. So we came up with a new technology, and this is the Shopkick signal. It's a little box, it's a white plastic box, and it just plugs into a power outlet. It doesn't need any Wi-Fi or internet, and it's inside the store. And what's unique about this thing is that it emits an inaudible audio signal at 21,000 hertz, above the range of human hearing. And inside the signal is a unique code embedded that's different for each store. So we know exactly which store you're at, even in a mall where there's no GPS at all. And the microphone of the smartphone picks up that signal and recognizes that you're at the store. So it's completely privacy protected because the consumer decides whether they want to open the Shopkick app and receive the signal or not. So we have now deployed this thing in 7,000 stores, large stores in America, including Target and Macy's and Old Navy and Best Buy and Crate and Barrel. And these stores now have the ability to welcome you and give you a reward. And then the next step could be, if you think about in future out in the vision of Shopkick, is to make shopping better. Well, what if we can actually welcome you and show you an item that you like and guide you through the store and make it a more interactive experience? And maybe start even earlier. On a Sunday afternoon when you're sitting on your couch and you're thinking about going shopping, but you don't know where yet. And in the old days, people tended to get their Sunday newspaper and the Sunday inserts that showed them all the items they should buy. Well, I don't know when you've tried that the last time, but when you go through one of these catalogs, you like an item, let's say you like a pair of pants, two seconds later, you've probably already forgotten what you liked. And five days later, you never remember when you go to the store. What if you could actually have that digitally on your phone, put it into your favorites, and the next time you walk into the store at Macy's, it opens the application, it says, welcome to Macy's, here's your reward in the form of a virtual currency called Kicks. And by the way, here are the pants you like. You should check them out. That closes the arc, what we call the arc, from the couch to the store and makes it a much more coherent, consistent experience. So that would sh that's what Shopkick is doing. And the retail industry as a whole needs help. There's a lot of competition from the online world. We're talking about a $3 trillion industry that is only the US market for offline shopping. It's 12 times larger than, than online shopping. And yet, very little digital juice, as we call it, has been injected into the physical world. So that's what we do. We inject digital juice into the physical world and make the offline, touchable world a more interactive experience and make that more entertaining and fun. And hopefully with that, we can help 
keep stores alive and make them a better place for everyone, both the consumers as well as the retailers. In many ways, fashion has always been technology. Cutting a piece of cloth and turning it into something that can function on such a dynamic and expressive system as the body is an extraordinary technological feat. Technology has and continues to move ahead in leaps and bounds, and I think that's a very exciting thing for fashion. Many people have different ideas about what wearable technology is, but I like to think about it as interactively responsive garments and interfaces. As technologies advance and as they're explored with, they can extend our ability to communicate with each other. They can extend our knowledge about ourselves and what's going on with our bodies. Uh, they can communicate that knowledge to others if we want it to. Wearable technology occurs in two spaces at the moment. We have artists and designers doing a lot of highly poetic explorations that aren't able to be brought to market. But then we have examples of engineering driven wearable technologies that are brought to market. Helen Story and Tony Ryan, for example, are major leaders. They're champions in many ways of investigating how scientists and artists and designers can collaborate fruitfully to, to really innovate and look at how these innovations can play out in everyday life, so become products. Susan Lee with her BioCouture project is really looking directly at synthetic biology, biological systems to create new materials. Pauline Van Dongen is in many regards a younger researcher and she's uh, trained as a fashion designer and she's working with scientists to, to try to refine ways that wearable technologies can be developed in a fashion context and actually brought to market and this is one of the biggest struggles. We can see around us with some of the sporting applications of wearable technologies. We see microcontrollers paired with the body that can give you data about how you're running or how you're exercising or how your body is responding to situations. But as technology is evolving, we, we're beginning to see applications of, of the biosciences and the life sciences and the material sciences. We can 3D print DNA. How could that manifest itself in a wearable technology? there's a, a compromise between what's currently possible and what is desired um, in order to produce things at the moment and hopefully that compromise will be less towards the engineering and a bit more towards the expressive capabilities and extraordinary potential of wearables as we move forward. One of the big trends for 2014 is going to be wearable computers uh, from shirts that are coming out to shoes with sensors to Google Glass to uh, Apple iWatch uh, and we are seeing a startup here at PCH's Highway 1 called Ringley that is going to focus on wearable jewelry uh, that has all sorts of fun things inside and we're going to talk to them right now. <laughs> Mercando, the founder of Ringley, and we're a wearable tech meets fashion company. Um, my background, I come from the startup world. I've worked in the music industry. I was, right before this, I was VP of product at a company called Hunch, uh, which was acquired by eBay in 2011. So I stayed at eBay for a little while and, and left in March to start Ringley full time. Very cool. Yeah. Um, 
So you're obviously seeing the same uh, trends I saw that led to the book Age of Context, where mm -hmm. sensors are going down in cost and compute is getting smaller and smaller. I mean, now that we have a Google Glass in 49 grams, right? You can tell yeah. that something's happening uh, that makes this stuff possible. What are yeah. you thinking of with Ringley? Where are you well, guys? Uh, it's interesting because doing? a couple years ago, this our idea wasn't really possible. Um, so it's just until recently that the technology has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller, where we can start to fit electronics into things that we buy on a daily basis, such as jewelry. So one of our fo big engineering focuses is miniaturization. So we're trying to get the tech as small as possible, so it can fit in a lot of different form factors. Yeah. You know, uh, friends of mine have seen the Apple iWatch, which is going to have a curved piece of glass. Now they've and seen it. Yeah, <laughs> and they, they say it's pretty cool. And we have Pebble watches, and we have Basis watches, and uh, Wim Labs got bought by Google. So there's going to be some watches and things yep. to wear. So you're probably not the only company thinking about this. But where, where, I, where I'm predicting it's going it is a sort of fashion, right? It, if I walk closer to you and you have a phone that you've ena enabled me to see, why isn't it going to do something? Or why isn't my uh, notification going to make something happen? Or if I'm listening to Spotify, why isn't something happening on my apps? Yeah. Is that sort of what you're thinking? Kind of. And, and part of the problem we're trying to solve here is that it's, it's kind of for women, right? Women keep their phones in their purses. We don't hear the buzz happening as much as men do because you guys keep it in your pocket. Yeah. So how can we alert the user to these things or the things that are important so that they can then go and check their phone? So we're, we're doing a little bit of more of a pared down version. We're not having a screen in our initial products. Um, so it's really just through notifications of buzzing and light. Yeah, and the lights are changing. We, we, uh, we went to a uh, research lab in I Ireland and they showed us on the pin of a needle, uh, a grid of LEDs that just hundreds of LEDs. So you can really do very, yeah. very focused kinds of light. Are, are you playing with some of these new LEDs? Yeah, I mean, right now, no, but we're, we're definitely exploring them and thinking about them for the future. Right now, we're trying to get our first product to market and build a brand around it. Um, but, you know, all of these things, I mean, even we're starting to look into different ways to signal vibration. So right now, we're using a motor, but what else can we use to? to send that signal to the user. Yeah. And how can we get it as small as possible so you can fit it into anything? I mean, your glasses, smaller rings, wedding rings. So you're wearing a prototype, I believe, yep. right? And, and uh, it already is fairly small, but it's still pretty big as jewelry yeah. goes, right? So this is not what it's going to look like yeah. for final, but this is one of our early prototypes that um, we're showing to people. So but it's it's amazing that it's already that size. Yeah. You know when when we uh, Rocky and I went to Broadcom and we saw the first uh, Wi-Fi prototype, and it was a box this big. You yeah, know, and we I don't think of that, that right? Yeah. But it it shrunk down to less than an eighth of your fingernail. Mm -hmm. That whole box has shrunk down yeah. already, and you're and probably every iteration we do gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And oh. so what. Uh, on there, you probably have a little processor. You have a couple mm -hmm. lights, a, a little Bluetooth motor. Bluetooth energy. Okay. Uh, motor, battery, LEDs. And battery, uh, it probably, you don't want to mm -hmm. charge up your jewelry every night. You want yeah. it to maybe last a week. Well, we've actually week. solved that problem. But yeah, it, tell it, me, it will, tell it me will about last about five days. Yeah. Tell me, uh, how, how do you solve that problem of uh, being able to talk with yeah. Bluetooth to a phone and have some mm -hmm. lights and some motors on there? How do you get it to work? longer than just, you know, the, well, it all depends on how the many, eight hours my iPhone yeah. seems to last. <laughs> it all depends on how many notifications you get through the day. So if you're the type of person that wants to know when everything's going on, you can set it up that way, but your battery will last less. Yeah. But if you only want to know when the important stuff is happening, it will it will span more, you know, longer. Yeah. Um, and we figured out a way, we're not really releasing it yet, but um, to charge this thing where it, it mimics what you do in, you know, your regular life when you take it off your jewelry. So we're, we're being a little stealth on that part, but okay. it's really cool. Yeah. Our, you know, it, it, it requires a phone to work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't work on its own. Uh, are you thinking of using the other sensors in the phone to maybe mm, inform what you might do with lights, for yeah. instance? Uh, what do you mean by other sensors? Well, there's a motion sensor in the mm -hmm. new iPhone. There's an audio sensor in the new yep. iPhone. Uh, you know, and so if I walk into a club, maybe I want it to react to the sound at the club, right? Yeah, we've, we've definitely tr 
started to think about how you know your brain can influence your your real world experiences right so we're looking at retail a little bit we are starting to think about concerts and other things like that we haven't played too much with that yet um, but it's it's definitely there and we're you know we'll probably be releasing an API where people can play with it as well yeah are you thinking of experiences like walking through a shopping mall and if mm -hmm. something on your to-do list is nearby could it yeah. change a color or something like that are, yep. are you thinking about something stuff like on that? your saved list or if there's a sale happening with a store that you like we're thinking about all that and the other thing is you know, do people really want to walk around stores with their phones out, right? If you start to think about all this eye beacon stuff, people still think that, okay, I'm going to walk around the store with my phone out, but we kind of want to eliminate that. So we want all the stuff to happen on what you're wearing so you don't actually have to pull your phone out. Even payments, right? You still have to take your wallet out of your bag to pay. Yeah. You still have to take your phone out of your bag to pay. How can we eliminate that? Yeah, if you walk into a Starbucks and you mm -hmm. and you say uh, pay, tap, pay. Um, it'd be nice to have a green light to indicate that, that it all worked yep. or something like that. Right? Yeah, and we've put an accelerometer in too so it can detect tap, so it can detect other things that, the other inputs that the user gives it. We're here at uh, uh, Highway 1, which is a new uh, incubator for startups like you. At, and there's a lot of weird equipment around here. Yeah. I saw you guys just pull something out of a 3D printer. What, yeah. uh, what does it mean to be here? Um, so, I knew nothing about hardware going into this, which is probably actually a good thing, because maybe I wouldn't have started if I knew what I was getting into. But um, Highway One's been great in teaching us how to take our, our prototypes to mass production and how to use all these tools and all these resources. So it's been really great in teaching us the process of building something physical. Yeah, I don't know that PCH has ever made jewelry before, so <laughs> this is probably taking them into a new area and, yeah. and having to force their uh, supply chains to think in a new way. Is that true? Yeah, well, it's interesting because Liam Casey's background is in fashion, so he's loved our company from the beginning and has been a big supporter. And he said, if you guys need a jewelry factory, we'll find you a jewelry factory. So that's yeah. been really nice to have that, those resources. And so, you know, you're going to take this prototype and keep making it smaller. You're a jewelry designer as well, so you have to think about fashion. I, yeah, so I, I'm not personally a jewelry designer, but okay. we have jewelry designers working for us to come up with our, our Ringley line. Okay. Yeah. And so and we do plan on doing partnerships. Again, us focusing on getting the tech as small as possible enables a lot of possibilities for the design of these things. We want the consumer to buy something because you know, they want to wear it and it looks good to them and it matches their personal style which is interesting, you don't see a lot of that happening in wearables today. Yeah, that's a different skill than most Silicon Valley startup mm -hmm. tech people have, you know, which are trying to come up with a cool yeah. iPhone app or something like that. But it's interesting starting to blend the worlds and that's where I'm like really focused on. I mean, my background's in both art and human computer interaction. Yeah. So bridging technology and the arts together has always been something I've been interested in. And I think it's great, you know, the fashion people are embracing working with technologists and we're embracing working with them. So I think you're going to see a lot more interesting collaborations in the future. Your company name is Ringley, which means you're probably going to do a ring like, like you have on <laughs> yeah. your fit. Are you thinking of earrings or pendants or other kinds of wearable jewelry and wearable fashion? Yep, we're thinking about bracelets, rings. Um, stuff for men, watch bands, or a piece that you can slip onto your watch. Um, but, you know, we have to solve problems. So when I first came up with this idea, it was a little bit before all the wrist stuff was out. And I just always saw it as a ring first. So we went with that. Um, but, you know, as long as we can solve problems, we can build anything. Yeah. Tell me about some of the tools that you use here mm -hmm. to design yeah. this software. Because you, you have so you to come up with. You just saw us taking the, yeah. the, the 3D printed rings out of the acid bath over here. <laughs> but yeah, we use the 3D printers a lot. We use soldering irons. Our, again, our stuff is really, really tiny, so we have to use microscopes in order to solder. Um, yeah, we've, we've done some you know, laser cutting, that kind of thing. Yeah. How did, how have you been capitalized? So do venture capitalists get 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 what yeah. you're trying to do? Well, it's interesting because I'm pitching a product for women to a bunch of guys, a bunch of VC guys, and all of them got it when their wife said, "I want one of those." <laughs> they always went back and they came back the next day. And they're like, "My wife wants one. <laughs> yeah. You're in." 
Um, but yeah, we've been able to raise some money so far, Very which cool. has been great. You're going to announce, uh, what, what's your roadmap for 2014 look like? Because are you going to ship in 2014? We're, yeah, we're hoping to ship um, at the end of spring, early summer 2014, and be ready for next fashion, uh, fashion week in September. Are you um, uh, giving any idea of what the price of these things is going to be? Or? Yeah, we're trying to keep it to around 150 to $200. Okay. Yeah. And again, nice, nicer materials. It, it all depends on the type of material. So type of stone, type of metal that we're using. It's, cool. it's all going to be a factor. It's going to be fun to watch you guys. It's going to be what, awesome, yeah. I, I'm I can't sure wait. I'm going to buy my wife one of them, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she likes jewelry and she's yeah. a geek, so, you know. <laughs> That's a perfect combination. <laughs> she can be our early adopter. <laughs> exactly. Um, where do I uh, learn more about you guys? Where do I watch you? Yeah, or? so we're ring.ly online to so sign up for our website. Very cool. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Robert. Thanks. So I have with me today Rob Roya. Did I get that right? Roya. Uh -huh. Roya. Uh -huh. Roya. And he's with a company that's called First Warning Systems. But I understand you're going to change your name. We are right. Uh, can first, you share? Uh, no. Yes, <laughs> yes I can. Uh, so First Warning Systems is the name that people have really gotten to know us by. Um, the the media has called it a smart bra type yeah, of application. It sounds a little bit like a burglar alarm. Yeah, though. but that's so, part of the reason, yeah. right? Um, that and because the name was so popular that all domains globally were gobbled up. So uh, we came up with a name that we really believe better identifies who we are, and the name is Circadia Health, and that's spelled C Y Circadia Health. Of and course, this is Silicon Valley, so we never spell anything the way it's supposed to. Exactly, <laughs> right. But it also puts us in, a, in the front page of Google because no one else spells it that way. And uh, more importantly, it really talks about how we look at uh, the body's change in cellular structure over a 12 to 24 hour time period, which is a normal circadian rhythm. Uh, well, what the, what the name really constitutes is that it's an early breast cancer, cancer screening system. Uh, it allows us to have a, um, a wearable body media device that is worn under the woman's normal garments. Okay, no x-rays, I take it. No compression, no x-rays. <laughs> right, the two main things. Yeah. Right? Uh, so it's a very comfortable garment that you wear for up to about 12 hours under your current um, garments. And uh, we do something called circadian testing. We look at changes in cellular patterns over that time period. And um, historical trials of 500 patients have told us that we're about 90% correlated to the actual state of, of, of cancer. Okay, so I just wanted to dig into that a little bit. So what are you picking up? You're picking up heat? Mm -hmm. what, what, what is the sensor actually sensing? Yeah, you actually, um, you actually look at the change over time in uh, heat pattern um, definition. So it's a time-related algorithm. Uh, what we do is a what's called predictive analytic um, uh, algorithm uh, and sets of algorithms that allows us to test changes of cellular patterns over a 12 to 24 hour time period. And would I be safe to assume that um, cancers probably show up as hot spots? They, uh, two things. Uh, w great question, by the way. Uh, the first area is that, yes, we do have the ability to show location through hot spots, and okay. there are reasons for that, that, um, that certain um, cellular changes and vascular changes uh, happen and chemical changes actually happen upon the production of additional cancer cells. So we actually see that. Uh, we also see... You, you see the chemical changes, something different from heat? We, uh, yes. Well, okay. well, no, it's all heat related. It's all so, heat related. So we detect okay. the heat differentials based okay. upon the uh, first, the uh, beginning in growth and then the uh, more uh, exponential growth of cancer cells over normal cells. Uh, the second thing that we appear to be seeing is that something that the National Cancer Institute has looked at is a reduced protein association to those genes that help to change your, your cellular process over a normal 24-hour time period.
Well, our indication is, is that most women that are supposed to, after a certain age, do their monthly breast exam, simply don't. Right, I don't think I know anyone who does a <laughs> breast exam. Exactly, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Yeah. Uh, but when we have polled uh, women who have said, I'd really like to know about my condition, but I certainly don't want to do my monthly breast exam, would you use this type of a device that may not only give you your impression of your current health, if you will, of your, of your tissue, but what if you could communicate with your sister who you knew had uh, a familial issue like you do, uh, or your mother had cancer, so therefore you want to know about all of your aunts. Uh, so what do you do about family, and can you communicate, intertwine with that, if you will, on a smartphone device that allows uh -huh. you to check on the health of your own daughter? Uh -huh. So yes, so yes, it's, a, it's an uh, early screening device can be used through smartphone-enabled technologies, and it does have social interaction capability. Okay, well, it sounds really interesting. Um, our time together has really gone by very fast, uh, but I want to ask you a couple of quick questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one is, when's it going to be on the market? Mm -hmm. uh, we expect it to go into our clinical trials this fall here in the United States, and then limited trials in India, Singapore, Japan, and South Korea. Okay, so these are phase, what, one? Phase two? Uh, well, we are through our third generation of the device. We have a 510K clearance on the original device. So this is a modification of, of the, the newest wearable technologies, flexible grid technologies. Okay. But when can, when, when, can, when can I go to the store and buy one? Commercially? Yes. Uh, if you live outside of the United States, you'll be able to buy some in about the middle of 2015. Uh, we're looking okay. at Not May, too June, far. July time period. Am I going to be able to afford it? Uh, yes, you will. Actually, you'll be on a monthly basis. You'll be able to uh, use the device on an ongoing basis and just pay through your cell phone. So, oh, okay. Yeah, so I'll, really I'll lease it like my car. Yeah, exactly. But not anywhere close okay, to that price. It's going to be much more And um, yeah. uh, just a couple of business questions. So uh -huh. um, you're, you're actually running this like a medical device. So I know you've probably had significant expenses to get where you are. We have. Um, mm -hmm. What's the source of your funding? Well, right now, uh, we are at our, um, our final seed funding. So in the last six months, uh, we've raised, um, and the total of our seed money has been almost 1.8 million total in to date. And uh, we've just recently gotten another million dollar raise that's uh, being infused as we speak today through the middle of next month. So our, our total seed funding for a launch will be about 2.8 million. Uh, we're then heading into what's called our Series A raise, which is our uh, upcoming $5 million raise. And that actually starts now. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. So all you investors out there who are listening, here's your opportunity. It's really the first time we've had something so completely different in breast cancer screening mm -hmm. in decades, really, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that it's wearable and social is really exciting. So I want to thank you very much for spending time mm -hmm. with us today, and I wish you the best of luck. Thanks, Pat. Great seeing you. window, that narrow window in time where pretty much any problem that we can see, we can start to understand it, fully understand it, and also have the opportunity to do something about it. When it comes to population, we're at 7 billion, we'll probably end up at 10, maybe 11 billion, but most, most scientists agree that we're going to start leveling off and population will eventually be stable. The one part that we don't really know much about is consumption how much we consume, and we consume all the stuff, not just because we need it, but because we think it actually makes us feel happy. That's a really weird thing. So it turns out that virtually any way in you can measure human well-being, whether it's healthcare or education or how long we live, things have been getting better. But when it comes to happiness, it's not so clear. Are we really happy than we than our parents were, and are they, were they really happier than you know, several generations ago? That's a harder question to answer. If we can divorce now our need for consumption as the driver towards happiness, then I think we really have a chance of not just living uh, f and fulfilling our aspirations on this planet, but doing so in a way in which they can really make us feel happy as well as make sure there's enough space for everyone else.
happening in China, for example, in real time. And the third reason is we're a planet with 7 billion people heading to 10 billion. When you have that many people, every impact is going to have a ripple effect. So those three reasons are really causing the pendulum to sort of shift back today and once again make us rethink our connection to nature. Instead of seeing humans as separate from nature, we're starting to once again understand that nature in some ways is the ultimate social network and we humans are very much part of it. Now nothing brings to me that point or illustrates that point better than those photographs that came to earth from those uh, Apollo astronauts. So when, when the astronauts went out to space and took those photographs, all of a sudden we could see the whole planet. We could see all of planet Earth for the first time in the history of humans. In fact, in the history of any species that has ever lived on the planet. And that moment to me really symbolizes this next era that we're going into. An era where we, our eyes are opened to the impact that we can have but we also have the opportunity now to do something about it and do something about it at a planetary scale. So how do I feel about the future? Here's what I think. I think technology will really help us to a great deal in moving us forward in solving some of the big intractable problems we have today. But really and most importantly I think what's going on is right now we had a big impact on the planet. We've caused extinctions of species in the Pleistocene big mammals like the mastodon and the mammoth and with that kind of extinction, the extinction of these big mammals, we might have even tampered with the atmosphere. Those animals produced methane. When we wiped them out, we reduced the concentration of methane in the atmosphere. So humans have been a huge influence on the planet and nature and we've been part of it. Then came agriculture and with agriculture and the settlement of cities came specialization. When we started specializing on one particular kind of job, we started divorcing ourselves from nature. The guy who makes the wheel no longer needs to know where his water comes from or where food comes from. He can simply trade that wheel for food. And that has continued all the way into the industrial era. Go out on the street today and ask someone, where does your water come from? What are they going to tell you? They're going to say the tap, right? They're not going to really think about the river. So the pendulum has swung all the way from connection with nature to disconnection with nature. But now it's starting to swing back again for three interesting reasons. Reason one is that science has come up to a point where we can really understand the impacts we're having on the planet. The second is social networks. Social networks today are allowing us to collaborate and create collective action and also understand collective impacts around the planet. So something that's happening to me here, I can communicate with and compare with what's happening. I believe that current electronics based on the big size and high performance and huge energy consuming electronics change its paradigm to flexible, lightweight and cell power devices that can be used in a human friendly electronics. Here's our group's achievements that one plastic substrate generating power itself and computing and communicating with others that can uh, detecting or treating the disease or even blind people can see. And first topic that I want to discuss is the cell power energy. If device generating power itself, they can be used in an implantable biomedical device and sensor network for the environment and safety and energy source for the flexible electronics and the machines. And here's uh, our group's the vision that shows that the pl one plastic substrate generating power and computing, light emitting device and communication with other and then attached to the human organs detecting the signal and the treating the disease. How, uh, how we make our cell powered devices is the thin plastic substrate. We fabricate flexible piezoelectric In 
northern Tanzania, there's a place called Lao Toli. Most tourists who go the, to that region, go to the Serengeti and other big national parks, go right by Lao Toli because at first glance, it's an unremarkable bit of savanna. But what makes Lao Toli special is that laid out in volcanic ash are footprints. Footprints made by early hominids, early ancestors of humans, that were laid down over 3.5 million years ago. Now to me, what makes this place really special it's not just the hominid prints, but also all the other prints that surround these footprints. They're prints of lots of other kinds of animals that live there. So you see hyena prints, an extinct form of elephant, wild boar, and many other species, actually 20 other species of animals crisscrossing these early proto-human prints, if you will. It makes you realize that as long as humans have been on this planet, we have been part of and interacting with nature. And sure enough, we've modified nature in all sorts of ways. We clear grasslands by burning them. We cut down forests and have been doing so for a long time. We've domesticated animals like horses and, and uh, dogs. And all those things have had 